Six, Year One Hundred of the Dawn. The First Womb. Your breath has God in it. That is why it healed me. God changed himself into a mother's love. George Gomez, The Music from the Water. I'm wondering if women need to help in order to be fulfilled. Is this a need or some equation that comes together to fulfill our purpose and journey? We were made to be the helpers, alongside, opposite, a counterpart. So I would speculate there's a certain amount of satisfaction in being a counterpart with purpose. Well, in helping the right person. A helper is someone who contributes to the fulfillment of a need or furtherance of an effort or purpose. I like to think of a helper like this, that God desired to make women to further his purposes, not just to further a man's purposes. That makes me feel special, not just a baby-making machine made to populate his creation, but truly fashioned to further his purpose. They say that men find fulfillment in their work, but I think that since work, toiling the land was the curse over men, then for them to find fulfillment in it would not actually be their greatest purpose, would it? Aren't they instead striving to find fulfillment in the curse? And when men are threatened by women in the workplace, could it be because they find too much identity in work? Is it all they have? No, of course not. Men can be fulfilled by loving others, their wife and their children. Men can also find fulfillment in friendships and ultimately in loving God. And if the curse over women is to desire a husband and pain in childbearing, if she spent all her time thinking about or desiring her husband or a man rather than simply helping him because she was made to help, wouldn't that also be trying to find fulfillment in the curse? I suppose finding fulfillment in children could be included. No, probably this is different. But anything that fulfills a woman poses the risk of becoming her god. The love for a man or a child should never take the first place in our heart, of loving God. Although, I'm sure that women find a certain amount of fulfillment by doing what is natural for our bodies to do, too. You think I'm going to say having sex, which is good, but it's more than that. It's having a baby or caring for a baby. Before I had Abel, my first extraordinary son, I had a certain amount of restlessness and some sort of unnamed void. When Abel came, I rejoiced to find such a deep level of satisfaction in being with him, nurturing him, loving him, feeding and taking care of him. There was something deeper about being a mother. I had a sense of completion, like wow. I was made to experience this natural phenomenon. This is why I have put up with that constant uncomfortable cycle. It felt more complete than just being with Adam. The pain associated with childbearing is the curse not the ability to bear children. Motherhood was meant to be a blessing from the beginning. If I had had a baby in the garden, I may have known an absolute, heavenly circle of love. But alas, I had Abel outside the garden, under the curse, where, yes, the circle of love was complete in childbearing, but not void of pain. Born into a world under a curse, Abel would one day taste an early death at the hands of his own brother, another of my blessings, who was born under the curse. I'm writing these memoirs with the hope that they will trigger a sense of truth in my future descendants. Yes, I hope they will be like a pointed arrow of truth that hits a mark through a very thick cloud of confusion, darkness, and smoke shedding some light from the garden. For truly, it is back in the garden that most, if not all, of humanity will be looking, somehow knowing that although life can be full of joy and laughter, it is fleeting, 
contrasted with the reality of death, sickness, hunger, depravity, and abuse. As I write, I know that there will be different cultures, some of which will offer more freedom, some with less suffering than others, but all women will share a common bond. There will be an eternal search for what we know is perfect and good. I believe that even in our happy times, our blessed seasons of life, even in our times of love and fellowship with one another, for everyone, there is an inner longing for something more. When Adam and I were cast out, I looked back at the entrance to the garden, where now the cherubim stood guard with their flaming swords. Such a breathtaking and eerie sight. I had no idea what it truly meant, yet I wept bitterly. I wept as you reading this might weep, when you know that you have done something wrong, and there is a consequence that will end in someone's suffering, if not just your own. As you look back at the door that is shut to the garden you once knew, you will join in my thoughts, my only thought. Is there a way back? Can I ever be in the garden again? The first moment I saw Abel, his sweet, angelic little face looking up at me, was a garden moment, like I had a flash of memory of the garden. Here is perfection. Here is what should be, what was meant to be. Here is a clean slate that can be written on without stain or blemish. He, my wee lamb. Here is my garden of angels, my son. Well, it only took a short while before my garden vision was shattered by his screams in the night for my milk, his poopy fig leaf, and later, of course, when the toddler emerged. Oh yes, it was the same then as it will be for you later, when you discover something about your perfect child, which is called selfishness. There comes a moment when you realize that your child is all about himself or herself. No more garden. Adam, what were we thinking when you said, let's go for it, while we were making love? Obviously, neither of us was thinking. Of course, I loved Abel with all of my heart, as I did all of my children after that. I think a woman needs to love, or is at her best when she is loving. What would the world be without women? We are the softening effect. We can be strong and soft. It's very powerful, and we need to keep that tender side, that nurturing side. Without it, humanity would be too raw, with too much testosterone. If a woman can't have a child or doesn't want to have a child, I think it's important to love a child, any child. Unfortunately, because of the fall, there will be billions of children over the centuries that need love and do not have enough. I urge all of my descendants to love these children. A woman, I believe, who has not loved a child or someone else more than she loves herself, is in danger of becoming selfish and bitter as she grows older. It's only natural that if you're not nurturing, you may fall into a trap of becoming self-absorbed. I'm not saying we should spend all of our time nurturing. Heavens, no. But we need to keep it in our veins, our hearts pulsing strong, womanly love to those around us. We need to pump love as well as blood. There will come a day when some women will be heartless. These will be dangerous times for humanity. When women are heartless, who will guard the eggs? the children, the home. I believe the womb is our strongest internal organ, next to the heart. Without the womb, what would be the hope for humanity? The womb is not just the place for my babies to grow, it is embodied in the bowels of my compassion. My womb gives life to another human being. My compassion gives life-giving energy to foster children who are not my own. Yet. Since I am Eve, you are all my children, and I, as the first woman, am giving you the capacity, the groundwork for a fruitful womb with all of my heart's voice. Wow, 
the first womb. Initially, I didn't realize I had a womb. In the garden, there were only Adam and I making love by the moonlight. It would have been cool to have a baby there, without any pain. I wonder how that would have worked. Maybe like anesthetics without the use of a needle or any side effects. That would have been the best. But I have never known anything but the throbbing pain associated with childbearing. And that is the worst ache, at least for my first baby. It was like five knives are stabbing me over and over, causing me to react by not breathing, and there were no Lamaze classes in my day. Of course, with each baby, it got a little easier. I had one of my babies, from labor to birth, in 45 minutes. Totally telling the truth here. I mean, come on. I was the first woman with the first womb with the first pregnancy. I didn't even know what was going on, let alone have anyone to prepare me for labor and delivery in that first natural childbirth. Not to mention the discomfort I felt afterward as well, laboring through the long nights of Abel's first cold, his teething, which seemed to go on forever, his colic, and the constant spitting up. It was so hard. I had no self-help books to read from other mothers who had gone down the road before me. I had no mother to help, no grandmother, no aunt, no doctor. It was only Adam and me, and he didn't really understand what I was going through since he had never experienced childbirth either. Believe me, if he had, or if any man had, the earth would not get overpopulated. There I was, virtually alone. Adam was working all the time. After all, we had just been cast out, and he had just started his own business as a farmer-rancher or hunter-gatherer. What were we? Oh, who cares? We were rich, spoiled brats who had had it all in the garden, and now we were trying to make it on our own. We started out as hunters as we were learning to grow crops. I would get so tired from being up all night and so lonely. Then, there was Abel's little face looking back at me, so cute that I swelled up with tears. And then he was back at it, wah, 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 all night long. This was a lot tougher than I'd ever thought possible. Oh, to be back in the garden. Abel's cute wee self was like a garden experience each time I picked him up. Goo goo, ga ga, wiggle those little toes at him, hee hee, ha ha, fun. But then I literally thought I was going to die from sleep deprivation. I didn't die, obviously. I went on to have more and more children. What on earth was I thinking? It was those moments of shared love between Abel, Adam, and me that got me hooked. We would have these family times of laughter and love. And then Adam would look at me like, Honey, let's do it again. And since there was no birth control, and I had yet to understand the rhythms of my body, there I was, pregnant with another one that would keep me up all night, spit up on me, poop all over, and eventually become a teenager. I had the first teenagers. No one could give me any calming advice. There was no one to tell me that it's going to be okay, that even though they say they hate you now, they will grow up and you'll have a new relationship with them as a young adult. Abel was actually pretty cool. But Cain? He was another story. And you all know how that went down. Later on, Cain was truly repentant. And as a mother, what was I going to do? Hate him forever for killing my firstborn? Cain was, after all, my second-born, and I loved him just the same. The heart of a true mother plays no favorites. True, it took years and years. I was so angry. But then I had to think of his pain, too. He had killed his own brother. The remorse of that had to have been much worse than the anger I felt. When I saw Cain's face, his brokenness consumed me not to mention the wrath of God that had been upon him. It was horrible to think of all that had happened, and I could see it in every line of his visage. 
the deep regret in his eyes, the windows to his soul revealing how alone and desperate he felt, was more than I could bear when he came to me, those years later, and asked for my forgiveness. But ultimate forgiveness wasn't mine to give. That had to come from a deeper place. I had already forgiven him, because I was his mother. How could I do anything but love him? He had gone through enough pain already. Come in, Cain. Come eat at my table and play with one of your new brothers. The past is the past. We cannot redo it. I needed the same forgiveness after eating the rotten fruit. How could I not offer forgiveness to him, my second son, whom I had brought into the world as a teeny, needy baby who did not want to be born into a world of sin? A mother's love is goodness and mercy poured out of a vessel who risks her life to prove her love. A mother's love is the glue that holds the world together. Later on, one of my distant sons, the poet Richepin, would write this parable, and it must have landed in my hands or been written on the wall of my heart so I could share it with you now. A widowed mother was living with her only son. They were the best of comrades, the most intimate of friends. But an adventuress got hold of the young man. She took away his money, his health, his position, his self-respect, and turned him into a vagabond. One day, she told him that he must give her a supreme example of his devotion. He must murder his mother and bring to his mistress his mother's bleeding heart. Accordingly, the young man went to his mother, killed her, cut her heart from her body, and holding it in his hand, hastened to the evil woman. In his haste, he slipped on the pavement and fell headlong. The heart rolled out of his hand. Then her heart spoke and said, Did you hurt yourself, my dear son? This is the heart of the mother. This is my heart as I write to you these memoirs. This is the heart of the first womb pouring out to you from yesterday into tomorrow. There will be mothers who don't have this heart. There will be sin and disease that destroy the true nature of a mother. This, perhaps, has affected you or your loved one. But I'm saying that anything that is not unconditional love is the fallen heart of a mother, and not the true heart of a mother that God intended in the days of the garden. You long for the mother of the garden, and you know what I'm saying is true. A mother's love is the nearest thing observable to divine love. It is a love that has no reference to the worth of the object, but pours out tirelessly from a wealth of love because of her inherent womb of love. It's all connected up with the heart, I guess, because even a woman who doesn't have children can pour out this love. God intended for you to have the perfect mother. His mother's heart comes from the mother side of God. The El Shaddai Remember I said that God is mother and father? The Hebrew name of God, El, is the mighty God, and the word Shaddai is derived from the womb and breasts. We could call this attribute of God the mighty mother, it is part of the nurturing, mothering side of God. This is part of what was lost with the King James translation. We crave a mother. We exalt Mother Earth, and some worship Mary. But our true mother is God. Later on, even Jesus will cry over Jerusalem, How often I would have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Matthew Chapter 22, verse 37. If you're alive on planet Earth, and I assume you are if you are reading this book, you had a mother, and she loved you, even if she could not love you the way she wanted to, or her love was so warped by the fallen world that she even hurt you. Even if she had to give you up for someone else to take care of you better than she could, in her heart, she carried the seed of the mother God and it is this seed of love that created a forever tree, which you can plant in your own heart 
and in your own proverbial womb. Whether you have your womb organ or not, it is still yours by nature, and from that rite of passage as a woman, you can bear children, birthed in the spirit or in the flesh. In your womb or your womb heart, the tree planted can grow, producing the fruit of real mother's love that you can offer to any child in need. Let it grow. Intense love does not measure. It just gives. Mother Teresa <laughs>